Hello YouTube. Freedom of expression, uh, a very important topic and one that seems to be increasingly controversial, so I thought we should do a few videos on it. Uh, now we can begin by making uh, two points. First, I don't think any sensible person would be a total absolutist about freedom of speech. Uh, there have to be some limits on what people can say. Consider threats, like saying to somebody, give me your money or I'll kill you or revealing high-level military secrets to a hostile foreign nation, or perjury, or fraudulent advertising. Uh, these things uh, may only be speech, but obviously they should be punished. So even those of us who are on the more libertarian side on this issue, and if you've got any sense at all, you'll be on the more libertarian side on this issue, but anyway, even those of us on the more libertarian side on this issue uh, will not argue that people should be permitted to say absolutely anything they want. Right? There, there, there have to be some restrictions. Second point uh, is freedom of speech is not just a legal principle. It's not just a matter of, of law. So something that I see, uh, this is something that comes up all the time um, when I, I see people talk about uh, freedom of speech online. So to take an issue like, for instance, no platforming at universities, this is where somebody is invited to speak at a university, uh, but then a university organisation intervenes and tries to block them from speaking on the grounds that they hold unacceptable views. There was an infamous case a couple of years ago where Jermaine Greer was due to speak at Cardiff University, but various people tried to get it cancelled on the grounds that she'd uh, supposedly said some transphobic things um, before. And more recently, apparently, Bristol University's student union has supported proposals to ban anybody they deem to be a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. So again, any, any feminists with transphobic views are out. Um, or think about cases where somebody has said something controversial on Twitter or whatever and has ended up getting fired from their job. Think about these kinds of cases. What often happens when stories like this are reported is uh, people will say, this is a threat to freedom of speech, which is a perfectly reasonable comment. But then, of course, we will get the legion of morons who come along and insist that this has nothing to do with freedom of speech because freedom of speech is about the law. And, well, there's no law against what Jermaine Greer said. Uh, freedom of speech is, is freedom from legal punishment, right? Any organisation other than the government can do what they want. Universities aren't the government, so if a university does this no platforming thing, that's got nothing to do with freedom of speech. This this is is is, is a, a facile argument, and it, it drives me crazy. First of all, it, it just reveals a complete ignorance of the historical debate. So as as we'll discuss later in this video, if you go and read the classic arguments for freedom of speech, it's it's not just about the legal prohibition, right? Um, the, the debate about freedom of speech has never just been about the legal principle. And if you put just a moment's thought into it, it's obvious why this is. Right? Imagine that you live in a very strongly Christian society. And imagine that because you have anti-Christian views or non-Christian views, uh, you're denied a platform at university campuses. Imagine that when you do organise somewhere to express your defence of atheism, the space is invaded by protesters who keep screaming and shouting and blasting air horns so that nobody can hear your ideas. Imagine if you go online and express your objections to Christianity on Twitter, you get fired from your job. Um, maybe because of some you know, mass protests boycotting the company until you're removed or, or whatever. I mean, in, in this kind of society, are you free to criticise Christianity? Well obviously not in any sense that actually matters. Uh, indeed, very often these kinds of social consequences can be even worse than the legal punishments. Um, I, I imagine that many people would probably prefer to be prosecuted and fined a few hundred pounds than to uh, completely lose their jobs, for instance. But anyway, the, the point is this. What we're concerned about is control of speech, suppression of speech, and there are many forms of control. Uh, prosecution, the, the penal system, that's just one method. So when we talk about freedom of speech, it's, it's not just a legal matter. Um, now, this is not to say, for instance, that universities should be legally required to 
host Jermaine Greer say? I mean, I think it's quite reasonable to say that universities should have the right to deny people a platform for any reason they want. But then it's perfectly fine for the rest of us to uh, object to that and to object to it on the grounds that it's a threat to freedom of speech as a, as a moral principle. Okay, so let's, um, with, with these preliminary points out of the way, let's turn to the arguments. Uh, and in this video, we're going to look at uh, Mill's classic arguments for freedom of speech. Mill was very much on the libertarian side. He affirmed essentially unrestricted freedom to debate any subject, scientific, moral, philosophical, political, theological, whatever. Uh, and as we'll see, he does recognise some limits, but only in very narrow contexts. Now, Mill gives essentially four arguments, um, although he has an, a nice general summary of his position, which I think is worth quoting. So uh, he says, summarising his position, the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it is robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion still more than those who hold it. If the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. If wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, the clearer perception and livelier impression of the truth produced by its collision with error. So let's look at this in, uh, in a bit more detail. So Tamil uh, notes that for, for any opinion that somebody wants to censor, there are going to be three possibilities. It, it might be true, it might be partially true, or it might be false. And Mill is going to try to show that in all of these cases, we will be worse off for censoring the opinion. So Mill's first argument is, well, maybe the suppressed opinion is true. Uh, to suppress an opinion that you disagree with is to assume that your own views are infallible, that you couldn't possibly be wrong. But of course, nobody is infallible. There's always the chance that the suppressed opinion is, uh, is correct. We're all imperfect and, uh, and, and limited. Um, you, you know, maybe we're wrong even about things that, uh, that we believe very strongly. And of course, if the suppressed opinion is, is correct, then it will be our of our to our benefit to hear it. Truth is is valuable. Uh, it, you know, we we it al it's always helpful to act based on the truth. I mean, an, an important point here is that people, individuals, are deeply ignorant. Each individual knows very little. Uh, even if you had a thousand lifetimes, you'd still be able to learn only a fraction of all there is to know. So we have to work together to find the truth. We have to allow controversial opinions to be judged by as many people as possible. To suppress an opinion means that no other person will be able to judge it. Um, but for all we know, well, it, it could be true. I mean, consider history, right? There was a time when it seemed just obvious that the Earth was the centre of the universe. For a long time, this was assumed in the best astronomical theories, and of course, it seemed like common sense. It turned out to be wrong. Or you might just think of an everyday claim like grass is green. Everybody can open their eyes and directly see that grass is green. But it's actually, it's at least questionable whether this is true. We now know that our colour perception depends on the specific details of our visual systems. Species with different visual systems will see colours differently to us. Some philosophers argue that colour is essentially just an illusion. So, I mean, if a claim like grass is green, if we recognise we could be wrong about that, then we should recognise that, you know, no, no matter how obvious something seems, there's always a chance that it might be wrong. And so it should be, you know, we, we should allow it to be debated and discussed. Now, uh, one uh, objection to this argument is, well, surely censoring an opinion no more assumes infallibility than any other action the government might take. Suppose the government makes some law banning the dumping of waste into local rivers so as to protect the ecosystems. Well, you know, banning this action doesn't assume infallibility, so why should banning certain forms of speech that are deemed dangerous? After all, governments can only ever act based on what they think to be true. Uh, we can find many examples of plans for environmental protection that seemed like good ideas but that ended up backfiring. That doesn't mean we should never attempt to protect the environment, that we should never make any legislation to protect the environment. So. Uh, I mean, I guess the, the, the objection here is, well, if a government has reason to believe that some opinion is false and that the promotion of the opinion would be dangerous, 
you know, surely they would be obligated to to act on this uh, if if the government sincerely believes and let's say they have good evidence for believing that uh, allowing the publication of uh, racist or sexist material will promote hatred and undermine social stability and whatever they would be failing in their duties if they didn't censor it. Uh, a second objection to this first argument is it, it seems like actually there are some views that we can basically be sure aren't true. Um, I mean, I guess you can never claim absolute certainty. Uh, after all, maybe the uh, external world doesn't even exist and all of your experiences are hallucinations. But you know, putting aside this kind of radical sceptical hypothesis, I mean, th th there are some things that we can say pretty conclusively are just wrong. Um, like, the Earth is flat, right? I mean, we've sent things into space to photograph it, we can see that it's not flat. Or consider uh, the claim, um, like, blacks are incapable of rational thought. I mean, that kind of extreme racism is, is just obviously not true, just clearly, obviously incorrect. Um, and in fact, Mill himself does seem to acknowledge that we can be sure of some things. He says regarding mathematical truths, such as the theorems of geometry, that there, there, there is just no defence of alternative views. Difference of opinion isn't really possible. Um, so, um, you know, so that, that may be uh, a bit of a problem with, with this first argument. Okay, Mill's second argument is, uh, and I quote, though the silenced opinion be an error, it may, and very commonly does, contain a portion of truth. In many debates, we find that neither side is wholly right. Uh, we might think that one side is uh, more right than the other, but still, uh, the other side can contain a portion of the truth. The world is uh, complex and messy, the human mind seeks simple patterns, we often exaggerate and distort, um, and so you know, e even if our position is basically correct, there may be things that we're still kind of missing. Uh, in, 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 in simplifying things, we may miss things. Uh, Mill gives the example that in most democracies, one party will emphasise tradition, order, stability, while the other emphasises progress and reform. Uh, and it's clear, he says, that we need a mixture of both approaches. Under pure conservatism, we would be in danger of stagnating and uh, failing to respond to problems. Whereas under pure progressivism, we would be in danger of throwing out traditions that, you know, that make our society good and that make it stable. Um, so each approach has serious deficiencies on its own. You need a mixture. You need some people pushing for reform, some people being more conservative, and that's the best system. I mean, maybe a, a more controversial example, consider Hitler's Mein Kampf. Now, I've never read Mein Kampf, but according to Wikipedia, apparently Hitler wrote that he, and I quote, wanted to completely destroy the parliamentary system, believing it to be corrupt in principle, as those who reach power are inherent opportunists. So, presumably most of the book is, is trash, but maybe, maybe Hitler had some perceptive criticisms of the parliamentary system. I mean, that's not to say that we would agree that Parliament should be overthrown, um, but like any political system, it does have its flaws. And maybe Hitler had interesting things to say on this point. Maybe some of his criticisms were, uh, were, were, were on target. If you ban Mein Kampf, then you ban that, those, those grains of truth that are in Mein Kampf. So um, I think that the main objection to this argument is, well, you know, it, it may be right that there's a grain of truth in what your opposition is saying, but then surely there will be many other means of uncovering those truths. So let's assume then that Mein Kampf does contain good criticisms of the parliamentary system. Well, surely other people, right, people who weren't promoting racism and anti-Semitism, uh, could have made those criticisms as well. Uh, indeed, I mean, people probably did make those criticisms, right? There's, there's been a lot of political philosophy from many different points of view. I would guess that 
everything that's good in Mein Kampf, if there's anything good in it, has probably been said by other people. Any good criticism of the parliamentary system has probably been made by other political philosophers. So even if, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the opposition contains a grain of truth, but that doesn't mean you need to permit them to say anything they want in order to uh, access those grains of truth. Um, so uh, that was Mill's second argument. Uh, Mill's third argument, um, and I think this is probably his most interesting one, is, okay, well, suppose that an opinion is false, right, just completely false, and we're sure that it's completely false, doesn't contain even a grain of truth. Mill says that we must still allow the opinion to be expressed because it's only by debating opposing views that we can properly understand the justification for our own views. So yeah, debate is essential to the justification of one's own views. Uh, Mill says, and I quote, even if the received opinion be not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be and actually is vigorously and earnestly contested, it will, by most of those who receive it, be held in the manner of a prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. So, I mean, there's, there's a difference between knowledge and mere true belief. I mean, there's nothing particularly special about having true beliefs. Anybody can have true beliefs because you can be right just by accident. You know, you could flip a coin to decide what your beliefs are, and 50% of the time you're going to you, you know, land on, on true beliefs, right? Knowledge is what we aspire to. And this means true beliefs that are properly justified. Now, if you don't allow your beliefs to be challenged, if you don't think through the objections, they will become dogmas, right? Any view that goes unchallenged is going to be whole, held on, you know, it, it's just going to be held on like merely emotional rather than rational grounds. The justification for thinking that a belief is true is partially going to be that nobody has managed to refute it. But then that requires hearing the opposing side. You need to hear the arguments and then show why the arguments are wrong, right? You need to hear the arguments against your belief and show why those arguments are wrong. If you are unable to refute the arguments for the opposing opinion, if you don't even know what those arguments are, then you, you really have no good grounds at all for rejecting it. You should just be an agnostic. You know, it's, it's like the, the very fact that there are some people who promote the claim that the earth is flat uh, is, is what reminds us of the justification for thinking that it's spherical. Now, of course, um, in philosophy especially, we emphasise the importance of considering potential objections to our views. And so you might say, well, you can come up with arguments against your views yourself. Uh, but Mill says that's not really going to be sufficient, right? It's not enough to, to try coming up with potential objections yourself or to hear potential objections uh, of, to your views from those who share your views. The strongest arguments against your views will be made by those people who, who earnestly believe that you are wrong. Uh, so you have to let those people speak. And I mean, more recently, uh, we have good psychological evidence that Mill was, was right about this. And this comes from research on what's known as motivated reasoning. Uh, so th there's this philosophical ideal of reasoning where you follow the argument wherever it leads. But in fact, even in the best of us, even in the best of circumstances, that rarely happens. More commonly, people have a preference for a particular position and then they come up with reasons to favour it. Uh, reasoning is, is motivated. It's guided by the conclusion you, you wish to draw. I think Jonathan Haidt had a nice uh, analogy where he said that reasoning is, is, more, like a lawyer, is more like a lawyer uh, for a client, arguing for a client, rather than like, you know, uh, a, a kind of purely objective, detached scientist evaluating the evidence in a purely objective way. Reasoning uh, kind of has, there's, there's a conclusion that you want to draw and then in reasoning, you're going to come up with reasons to 
accept that conclusion. And there's a lot of research about this, but just to name a couple of examples. Um, so uh, Lord, Ross and Lepper, uh, their, their article, Bias Dissimulation and Attitude Polarization, they studied students with strong opinions about the death penalty. And they found that when presenting research evidence that supported both sides of the debate, the students would tend to uh, fairly immediately accept evidence that supported their belief while they were hypercritical of the opposing evidence. Right, so, if it, so for like if a student is against the death penalty and they're presented with evidence that the death penalty is an effective deterrent, they're hypercritical of it. They, they really work very, very hard to, uh, to, to break down the, the study and find flaws in the study and so on. On the other hand, if they you know, see, see a study that uh, the, the death penalty is a really bad deterrent, then you just accept it. It's just like, oh good, evidence for my belief. Uh, in the article Motivated Skepticism, Peter Ditto and David Lopez discuss experiments which show that when people are given health tests, they're much more likely to search for reasons to be skeptical of the tests if they've had bad results. Uh, and more generally, um, Ziva Kunda's article, The Case for Motivated Reasoning, discusses a number of similar studies if you're interested. Um, so the point is, we don't evaluate evidence in an unbiased way. We are very good at coming up with arguments for our beliefs, but very bad uh, at seeing the flaws. We reason our way to the conclusion that we desire to hold. So to get the best criticism of your view, to get the best challenge, you need somebody who really believes the opposing opinion. You need a real opponent. And furthermore, given that our biases affect our reasoning. I mean, it's clear that an individual person is going to struggle to reach the truth on their own. The best method we have for reaching the truth is to subject every opinion to severe criticism. This is the ideal of the method of peer review in science. If you're a professional scientist, then you'll be very intelligent. You will have had years of training. Um, and you know, you, uh, you'll, I don't know, propose some theory, right? Write, write an article proposing some theory. And then you get a whole bunch of other brilliant minds who've had years of training on that issue to try to poke holes in your theory, to try to, to criticize it, to try to tear it apart. And then what do you do? Well, you, you, know, you go back and improve it. You fix the problems that they've found. Severe criticism is what drives knowledge forward, right? It's, it's, it's this battle between different ideas. Uh, you, you, you show the problems and then the defenders of those ideas fix the problems and they find problems in your view and you fix the problems and that's how uh, knowledge is created. So by silencing your opposition, you rob everybody, including yourself, of the ability to defend and justify your beliefs. It just becomes a mere prejudice. Mill offers a, a fourth argument, which is quite similar to the third. He says that if a doctrine is unchallenged, its very meaning will be lost. Not just the ability to defend it, not just the justification for the doctrine will be lost, but its very meaning. We will become unable to understand the doctrine. Uh, how, how does this doctrine require us to act? What does it imply about our other values and beliefs? We will become unable to understand it. Um, you know, I, I guess by analogy, right, if you live your uh, entire life with red glasses on, you won't really know what red is. It's only by contrasting red with other colours that you can grasp the concept of red. So consider, say, democracy. Could you really understand what democracy means and why democracy is important and why democracy should move you uh, like on a personal level, why, why it's something you should be committed to? Could you really understand any of that if you had never encountered anybody who challenged democracy uh, and proposed an alternative system. I mean, certainly it, you know, it would be hard to think about the value of democracy in that case. You know, we'd, we'd just take it for granted as that's the way the world has always been. Um, I mean, Mill, Mill says that this is one of the points of the famous Socratic dialogues. Socrates questioned the received opinion about things like knowledge and justice and in doing so, he showed that people didn't really understand the doctrines they claimed to hold. They just parroted the popular slogans, but you know, a little bit of critical analysis 
soon caught them up in contradictions. Now one uh, concern about the third and fourth arguments that Mill gives is there are many cases where opinions uh, become universally accepted or at least near universally accepted without censorship and this seems to be a good thing. As science progresses, as we develop more knowledge, some debates just become settled and then we move on to other things. Um, and that seems to be necessary for, for technological development, right? It, it, I mean, it's like, it has to be the case if we want technology to move forward that everybody recognises the at least approximate adequacy of certain principles of Newtonian mechanics. I mean, imagine if NASA was to try to engineer rockets on the basis of completely different theories, like flat earth theory. You know, if Na NASA had a bunch of engineers who were uh, acting uh, and creating rockets on the basis of flat earth theory or, or whatever, um, that would be a, a complete waste of money and it would, it would lead to all kinds of um, problems uh, with, you know, rockets uh, falling apart and stuff. So the universal recognition of truth seems to be a good thing. But Mill's third and fourth arguments imply that when a truth is universally accepted, we will be less able to defend it and we will have less understanding of it. We, will have, we won't perhaps even know what it means. Now Mill, uh, interestingly, he actually just accepts this. Um, he, he says that the universal recognition of truth is good overall, and it's often inevitable, but it does have drawbacks because we all lose the benefit of being forced to defend the truth against skilled opponents. And that's a loss, that's always a loss. It may be outweighed by other benefits, but it's still a loss. Um, and so Mill suggests that we should try to mitigate this loss. Uh, where, we, where we have universally accepted truths, we should encourage people, perhaps during their education, to play devil's advocate, to try to find the best case against the view. You know, rather than just teaching the facts educators should engage in, in debate and critique, um, you know, and, and, and perhaps show the reasons why, uh, or, or at least show the best arguments against the currently accepted view. That will do something to offset the loss um, of genuine opponents. But, but that is always, always a loss, um, and, and that, that's outweighed by other benefits um, but, but Mill, in, interestingly, just accepts that, that, yes, this is something that we lose when a truth becomes universally recognised. So anyway, um, those were uh, Mill's four classic arguments for uh, freedom of speech. And, I mean, the basic point of all of these arguments is the only way that we arrive at justified true beliefs is through vigorous debate. Um, and, you know, of course, very often the topics that are the most controversial are among the most poorly understood. They're, they're, you know, the, the, the controversial topics are exactly the ones that we need to be debating uh, often. The, the development of knowledge requires freedom of speech. Now, I, I'd also like to note, I mean, there's a, a fifth argument, I think, that Mill suggests in his discussion, although it's not sort of considered to be one of his classic arguments, but I think you can kind of see it hinted at in the text. So this is that silencing an opinion won't make it go away. It will just make people unwilling to express it. But the opinion will still influence them. It will be enacted in their behaviour, often in ways that will affect others. Um, for example, uh, it will be uh, enacted in their voting patterns, say. I mean, we perhaps saw a bit of this with the election of Trump. It seems that many people seriously underestimated how much support Trump had. Uh, now, of course, Trump supporters were not censored by the state, but in many places, I imagine there was a lot of social pressure not to support Trump. Um, so, you know, th the point is that in censoring people, you deprive yourself of knowledge of those other people. You, you deprive yourself of knowledge of why they act the way they do. Um, and that's that's never a good thing. Uh, you become less able to predict them, you become less able to engage with them. And worse, you deprive them of the ability to change their minds. If their opinion is silenced, then there will be no serious debate about it. They will never be able to express their reasons for holding the opinion, and so nobody will be able to give them the best case against their opinion. Right? They, they won't 
tell you why they hold the belief that they do, right? And so you won't be able to tell them what's wrong, right, with uh, those, those reasons. They won't be able to give their reasons for their belief, so you won't be able to tell them what's wrong with those reasons. So if you want an opinion to die, the best way is to let it fight in free and open debate. Okay, um, now there are a few points to note about these arguments. Uh, first of all, uh, it really should be clear, as we noted at the beginning, that Mill's arguments are not just about the law. Mill is urging us to create a society where diversity of opinion is tolerated. In fact, it's not just that we should tolerate unpopular views, it's not just that people should be allowed to express unpopular views, we should actively encourage the expression of unpopular views. So, you know, using the law to censor people, that's bad, but using social pressure to silence people is bad as well. In fact, self-censorship, silencing yourself in order to keep other people happy, that's also bad. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're silencing yourself, you're similarly depriving the human race. Freedom of speech for Mill is, is a general moral and social principle. You, you, should, you should always ex express your beliefs and your reasons for your beliefs, even if they're very unpopular, and you should encourage others to do the same. Second, uh, Mill frames his arguments in terms of truth and falsehood. Uh, so, so Mill is just assuming here that truth is valuable, it's better to have true beliefs than false ones, which you know, certainly seems reasonable. Even if we don't care about truth for its own sake, our projects are more likely to be successful when we act based on what's true. But arguably some views are neither true nor false. Uh, some philosophers, for instance, would argue that moral claims have no truth value. Uh, they, they might say that moral judgments are not really propositions but just expressions of emotion or whatever. Uh, I think, however, we can easily restate Mill's arguments so as to apply to this kind of case. Uh, consider a moral, moral view such as sex before marriage should be prohibited. Well, you know, I, I couldn't disagree uh, with this you know, more strongly, right? I, I completely reject this. Um, now, let's suppose somebody proposes censoring this view. So they, they say that it, it should be illegal to express the view that sex before marriage should be prohibited. Well, uh, regarding Mill's first argument, maybe sex before marriage actually does violate some other fundamental values of mine. I mean, maybe given my more basic moral values, I should think that sex before marriage should be prohibited. Right? I mean, this is how moral arguments often proceed. Uh, we often try to show that our opponent's view is in conflict with their other values. I must recognise that I'm fallible, so I recognise there, there is a chance that my uh, support of sex before marriage conflicts with deeper values I hold. Regarding Mill's second argument, well, even if I would never be persuaded that sex before marriage should be prohibited, maybe I could be persuaded that my own very liberal attitude uh, is in conflict with the more fundamental values I hold. So the, the debate might show me that I should moderate my own position. Uh, regarding the third and fourth arguments, well, um, as before, I can. The, the idea is I can only justify my moral views, I can only properly understand my own moral views by letting them face challenges. You know, if, if I never uh, speak to somebody who is much more conservative about sex, then I'm not going to be able to defend or justify my own liberal attitude towards sex. So, um, in general then, Mill's arguments don't depend on truth. They apply to the expression of any opinion where you can give reasons for or against that opinion, right? Re regardless of whether or not it has truth value. A third point follows from this, which is that arguably Mill's defence of free expression does not apply to all expression since there, there does seem to be some cases uh, of expression which don't involve the expression of an opinion or, or an argument. Uh, consider cases like art and pornography. I mean, prima facie, there are many artworks, and I would imagine most pornos, that don't express any particular view. Um, they merely depict things. A painting might depict a landscape, a porn film might depict people having sex. So. Yeah, we, we can, of course, interpret these images in one way or another, but arguably nobody 
is attempting to convey any message here. So Mill's arguments wouldn't apply in, in these cases. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Mill does recognise some limits on speech. Uh, the boundaries of free speech arise from Mill's harm principle. Uh, Mill sums up the harm principle and I quote, the only purpose for which power can uh, be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. The only time where it's uh, legitimate to restrict a person's speech is where that speech will cause harm to others. Now by harm, uh, Mill has in mind actual physical injury or damage to property or, or loss of property. Um, so offence, for example, is, is just not a kind of harm, right? Mill doesn't really recognise psychological harm. Um, it's, it's going to be, you know, damage to a person's body, damage to their property, you know, loss of their property, that kind of thing. Um, and furthermore, in order for censorship, censorship to be justified, the harm has to be uh, specific and direct. It has to be some you know, specific and direct threat to some identifiable persons. So, for example, I mean, w one limit that Mill recognises is incitement to violence. Mill gives the example that it's not acceptable to say to an angry mob gathered outside the house of the corn dealer that corn dealers are starvers of the poor. In this case, you're inciting mob violence against the corn dealer. And there's a fairly direct connection between your speech and the potential harmful action. You're already in a situation where passions are inflamed and there is uh, a lot of aggression, a very aggressive attitude directed against the specific person, the corn dealer, and you're encouraging further violence. You're you know, whipping up the mob even further. On the other hand, if you just print in a newspaper that corn dealers are starvers of the poor, well that's perfectly fine because there are many ways people might respond to that. I mean, they might form a mob, uh, or they might boycott the corn dealers, or they might seek legal recourse, or they might not, you know, they might just do nothing. Um, and of course, when people are reading a newspaper, they're not likely to be in a rage. They're not about to be swept along with the madness of a crowd as you get in a mob. Um, so that would be perfectly acceptable. Another example might be false advertising. Let's say I lie about the condition of a car that I sell you. I make it seem like it's in near perfect condition, but it's actually falling apart. Well, that's pretty much a kind of theft because you haven't properly consented to the transaction. Consent has to be informed, but you've been misinformed. Um, so, so that would uh, count as a kind of harm. Now, it's worth just pointing out that Mill uh, understood the harm principle as a necessary condition not a sufficient condition for censorship. So actually, uh, the harm principle is uh, another way or another argument that he would have for freedom of speech. Um, even if some kind of speech or expression doesn't involve the expression of an opinion, um, it can only be suppressed if it harms others. So with the case of like art, for example, uh, that perhaps doesn't express an opinion, well, it's still not okay to censor it because it doesn't harm others. Obviously, there's a lot to say about the harm principle. There's, um, there's a lot of debate about whether this defines the boundaries of acceptable speech. And even if you do accept it, there's a lot of debate about what exactly constitutes harm and what kinds of harm uh, make a, a legitimate basis for restricting speech. Anyway, we'll talk about this more in the next video, uh, but I think that's all for now. So thank you for watching, and I will see you soon. Goodbye.